All right, without any further ado, uh, we've got Matt Miller from Sonos, who's gonna review this new uh, Sonos amplifier and architectural speakers combination from Sonos and Sonance. Uh, take it away, Matt. Appreciate it, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending today. Um, I, I probably met some of you in uh, some of my visits or events that we've done at the, uh, the Troy location in Michigan. Uh, for those of you that uh, I have not met, um, I've actually been with Sonos now for a little over five and a half years, um, mainly focused on what we call uh, account management for the Great Lakes Territory. So I cover about six states, uh, including Michigan and um, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Western PA. So my focus is primarily in the what we call the installed solutions channel, um, which is essentially the independent dealers um, across that territory. So uh, I'm actually based in Dayton, Ohio, but um, uh, definitely always available uh, for additional questions or, or support after the fact. So today, actually, let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, we're gonna cover um, a recent announcement from Sonos uh, in a partnership with Sony Ants. And on here. So we're, we call this Sonos by Sonants. Um, very convenient that the uh, the names just kind of jive together. Uh, but this is really about um, delivering an engineered solution, uh, an architectural speaker that we can really pair uh, seamlessly with our new AMP, which was launched last November. So today we're gonna talk about a little bit about both products. So really core to Sonos' mission is about listening better uh, because we find that you know, by delivering epic music experiences, it just makes for an overall better lifestyle. Uh, we really have one simple goal, that's to deliver all the music on earth in every room of your house wirelessly. So a simple mission, but uh, I can promise you very, very difficult to, uh, to deliver on. Uh, it's just a lot of uh, behind the scenes work that goes into every product and experience that we have. So we really want to focus on how we look at Sonos, and we don't want to look at it as just one individual speaker. It's really a system. Uh, and the key word there is system because uh, all the products are designed to work together seamlessly and deliver that simple uh, yet impactful and immersive experience at the, um, uh, at the music level. So who is our audience? Um, our audience is what we define as the modern music lover. Uh, really what we call it internally is the MML. And we estimate there's over 200 million uh, MMLs around the world that uh, is a captive audience that we can go after. So there's a lot of pie to go after. Uh, we are just at the very tip of the iceberg in terms of the audience that we can serve. So lots of applications for Sonos, um, you know, beyond just a, a single play one in a kitchen to expand it into every room of the home. So why Sonos? Um, first off, because we are a system, meaning that it's multi-room, true multi-room audio that you can listen to you know, different music in every room of your house, or you can listen to all the same thing or any combination thereof. Uh, singular app control. So one of the things I always like to say about Sonos is it's, it's a great sounding product, um, whether it's you know, listening on a play bar to home theater or even via Sonos One and controlling it with Alexa. Uh, but it's really about that steering wheel. So what has really set us apart over all these years is that we've delivered on that steering wheel at the app level that gives you know, customers full control and immersive experience into the content that they want to play. Uh, and that's really what has set us apart from other manufacturers that have tried to uh, you know, really duplicate the Sonos experience. Uh, if you don't have a good steering wheel, then what's the point, right? You can have a great sounding speaker, but if you can't drive it, then it's, it's really not the, uh, a good experience at the end of the day. Uh, secondly, it's sound. Um, we deliver um, experiences where we have the authenticity uh, of the music, meaning that you know that music is natural. It's not artificially inflated with you know digital effects or anything. We are trying to deliver the experience that the artist himself wanted to deliver uh, to the audience. So that's one thing that we've always uh, really set a high standard for is in our sound quality. Uh, music selection, uh, I don't know if anyone knows this, but there are over 80 music services available on Sonos. Uh, just imagine, you know, when we say all the music on earth, we really mean it because we have so much content available on Sonos, uh, you could not listen to it in a lifetime. Um, we have over 40 music services available just here in the US uh, and constantly adding new ones, um, you know, all the time, every month, there seems like there's a new uh, music service to listen to. Uh, True Play. Uh, we've had True Play in our products and, and certain products since 2015. 
Uh, true play is really about delivering, again, an epic music experience because you want to have sound that's tailored for the room that it's in. Uh, every room is different, and we want to make sure that, you know, that experience is always operating at its peak, uh, you know, capability. So true play allows us to calibrate uh, different products as simply as using an iOS uh, device and the Sonos app to actually true play and calibrate it for that different acoustical environment. Uh, updates. So we like to say at Sonos that we begin a relationship with the speaker uh, really when it leaves the factory uh, because that product uh, can be updated and deliver new features over time. Uh, an example of that is the TruePlay technology. We actually launched uh, products in 2013 such as the Play Bar uh, that did not have TruePlay at that time and then to, you know, two years later, we actually did a software update and enabled TruePlay to make that product even better uh, over time. So that's really a, a tremendous value and why people love Sonos. Uh, and lastly, Wi-Fi. Uh, we are not a Bluetooth solution. We've never built our platform on Bluetooth and simply because Bluetooth is not a scalable solution. It's great if you want to take a, a, a speaker to the beach, uh, but it's not so great in the home because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You have a device that serves content directly to one other device and that's it. Uh, so Bluetooth has never been at the center of our technology. Uh, it is, you know, really a one-room solution as opposed to a multi-room system. So I wanted to talk a little bit about AMP. Um, as you probably have installed uh, Connect AMPs over the years, and that product had a, had a lifespan that literally went from uh, almost 12 years uh, in its current form. And, it, you know, fantastic product, literally millions, you know, installed. So it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, the Connect Amp has served very, very well. But there were some things that, you know, as technology evolved and applications changed and, and people wanted different capabilities, you know, what are the things that Connect Amp couldn't deliver on that we could really um, innovate and deliver on? So one of the challenges was, and you guys told us this very, very clear, was we need more power in the Connect Amp. Just 55 by 2 uh, was not delivering, particularly in those bigger spaces, uh, like a great room or perhaps for outdoor applications. Uh, and we needed to respect the rack because most of those Connect Amps were probably going into rack installations. Uh, and the four factor just really didn't you know, make it ideal for that situation. Um, Probably no surprise, but the Connect Amp was never engineered for uh, a rack install, although that's how many of them actually wound up being deployed. So uh, we needed to really take that into consideration when we come up with a new product. And then lastly was TV connectivity. Uh, Connect Amp was never, again, designed for you know, delivering um, you know, TV audio. While it had a line input, it was never designed for that. And as such, uh, it really was not a perfect solution for delivering TV audio. And then lastly, versatile enough. Um, so just having you know, more capability to deliver on different experiences in different areas of the room as opposed to Connect Amp, which was really engineered around one single solution, which is multi-room audio. So uh, last November, we delivered on it and brought out uh, the Amp and launched it officially. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already started to install these. Um, again, a completely redesigned uh, you know, Connect Amp from the ground up, uh, basically delivering on those key uh, pillars that I talked about in the previous slide. So a couple of tech specs here. Uh, very versatile. You've basically more than doubled the power, 125 watts of channel digital amplification. Uh, you can use it with you know, uh, freestanding speakers, tower, bookshelves, uh, in-ceiling, in-wall speakers. Uh, and again, stream everything that you want from the app uh, natively, or we've also added the ability to actually do true play. Uh, so I'm sure you know, some of you actually, you know, have uh, very iOS-centric households or customers that you work with, and AirPlay is a fantastic technology, particularly as Apple has really extended that in the last year uh, with AirPlay 2. So now, you know, you can take that iOS device and basically stream any of the audio, whether it's sound effects or music services or YouTube videos, you name it, you know, basically just pull that AirPlay menu up and, and fire that content directly at any AirPlay-enabled speaker in Sonos. Uh, and then lastly is the ability to actually connect it to your TV through HDMI ARC uh, and deliver you know, TV audio uh, with an architectural solution. So um, some of the comments I hear uh, pretty frequently are that, um, you know, the play bar, wow, it just uh, it, it looks a little bit awkward. It's uh, It doesn't match very well with this new Samsung Frame TV. So, you know, what, 
what can I do that's going to make this a little bit more of an aesthetically pleasing you know, scenario. So that's where architectural speakers can come into play. And we didn't have that capability with ConnectAmp. Now we have it with AMP. So a little bit of uh, just technical review on the app. You got two Ethernet ports in the back, uh, 10100s. Uh, so you can hardwire those in when you're putting them into racks. Uh, you know, same similar connectivity to the um, to the Connect amp. You have a, uh, a I'm sorry, a passive uh, sub output, so you can hook a third-party sub to it. You also have uh, the removable speaker connectors. So if you're doing a pre-wire, you can actually hook those up during the pre-wire, and you come back to do the full installation with the amp. You simply just jack them into the back. Uh, making your you know installation really really easy. Uh, you also notice on the rear there is actually that HDMI interface, which is going to allow you to deliver that TV solution. Uh, really awesome. Um, one thing of the note is that the HDMI interface, yes, it's designed to be used with ARC audio return channel. So if you have an ARC compatible TV, um, the nice thing is is that it really simplifies your control solution. Uh, where you can actually, you know, literally with one button press, um, have everything in sync and powered on and set the right inputs because the TV and the amp actually talk to each other to make sure they're all in uh, the correct inputs and configuration. Uh, now, I do hear from time to time that, uh, you know, ARC sometimes doesn't work as intended. Uh, there are issues with, you know, handshaking and perhaps it's not as reliable as it should be. So you do have the option, uh, if any of you have installed one of our new Sonos beams, um, you know that it actually ships with a small optical adapter, which allows you to use a traditional uh, QS output on a TV uh, to deliver that audio stream. And you can use that same adapter with the amp. It does not ship with it, but it can be purchased um, and sourced separately. So if you're not really confident in the reliability of ARC, then go ahead and use that adapter. Uh, it's an optical to HDMI female, which you can then use a standard uh, HDMI cable uh, to input into the amp. Cool. So you have the ability uh, with the amp to deliver full you know, TV room audio. Um, so you can actually use that digital interface to basically take that input and whatever's playing on the TV is going to output audio into the amp. Uh, and deliver up to a 4.1 surround experience using the amp, which is really awesome. Um, what we do for that center channel, um, if it's a 5.1 signal in, is we just basically create a phantom center off the two left, right, front speakers. Uh, so really cool, um, and it gives you, you know, just complete uh, uh, versatility with an aesthetically pleasing uh, design. So you don't have to have a big sound bar underneath the TV. You can hide those architectural speakers uh, in the walls and really deliver a, a pretty invisible but yet really awesome uh, sound experience. So it, by 4.1, I mean two amps, one driving left, right, front, uh, and second amp driving left, right, rear, and then you can use either a third-party sub or you can use a Sonos sub uh, to really dial it in for that 4.1 uh, surround experience. Again, you see in the slide, basically the HDMI ARC interface um, coming from the amp uh, or from the TV actually to the amp to deliver that TV audio. So the configurations here are 2.0, 2.1, uh, and 4.0 and 4.1 uh, to deliver that experience. You can deliver a full 5.1 experience if you use any of our home theater products. So that would be Play Bar, uh, Play Base, or Beam, uh, which would represent that LCR. Uh, you know, configuration, then use a second amp to drive the left, right rears, um, which can be in ceiling, in walls, or bookshelves, or you could use, uh, you know, our all-in-one products such as Sonos Ones to be the uh, the rear channels if you wish. So again, you, you really, uh, you know, get the point hammered home that versatility is what this product is all about. So so many different configurations to really uh, accommodate any design. Again, you can use a Sonos sub or you can use a third-party sub. Uh, to really deliver that great experience. Cool. So why is Sonos architectural by Sonance? You know, when we look at, you know, the modern home and how it's really transforming into this, uh, you know, smart home with multiple devices, uh, you know, aesthetics really take, uh, you know, a place in there. And you guys have been installing in wall and in ceiling speakers for years. And that's the value of you know, what you sell. You make that technology invisible yet functional. So how can we do that with Sonos? We want to make sure that we're keeping that standard high for the epic music experience and the TV audio experience. And that's really why we uh, established this partnership, because with using the, uh, a great partner like Sonance, we can deliver that architectural experience, but yet 
really um, you know, enabling the full capability of the Sonos products such as AMP uh, and Sub to really deliver um, an awesome experience that's invisible. So uh, Sonos by uh, Sonance Architectural is really optimized. This is an engineered solution. We did not take a stock Sonance speaker and just basically plug it into AMP and call it a solution. This has been engineered from the ground up. I uh, really can't stress that enough because uh, it took a lot of time and effort to really match these products uh, to make sure that you know they are operating at peak efficiency and, and full performance. So these are optimized for AMP, um, unique comb materials used across all three models, whether in ceiling, in wall, or outdoor. Uh, and then we also are able to actually detect these products when we connect them to AMP, and that allows us to actually configure the DSP and the AMP to perfectly match those products and deliver uh, you know, a sound experience that's like you know, hooking up a play bar because we control all the variables. So that's really uh, what this is all about. So uh, let's kind of go over the different models to give you guys an idea of how uh, everything shakes out here. Uh, the Sonos in ceiling speaker by Sonance is um, you know, a simple design, uh, six and a half inch woofer, one inch tweeter, um, panable white grill that's magnetic, just basically just uh, adheres right to the, uh, to the bezel as you complete your installation. And we also use a custom, what we call Sonos white uh, paint um, that is really designed to you know, resist uh, the effects of age, you know, through yellowing, obviously, probably all experience, you know, speakers that you put in years ago, and then, you know, you look at them now, and they just look kind of tired and old and dated, and they're just, you know, the, the bezels are all weathered, and it just does not look good. So, uh, we really engineer this to be in the home for an extended period of time, and, and uh, you know, resist all those specs, effects. Uh, you can paint these grills in, incidentally, so um, if you don't wish to have white or you want to match a, uh, a different color on a wall, uh, you can paint them. Uh, these retail at $5.99 a pair, and they are available now. Uh, just a couple of you know quick little tech specs on this. Because we can actually match um, you know, this speaker perfectly to the amp, uh, it allows us to use, do some unique things. These actually have a slightly higher uh, impedance value than a traditional 8-ohm speaker. So we can actually confidently hook up uh, six or three pairs, six speakers total uh, to a single amp. So when you have that really big room that has a vaulted ceiling and perhaps two or four just aren't really cutting it, you can actually do uh, up to six speakers um, with the Sonus by Sonance, uh, either using the in ceiling, the in walls or the outdoor. So again, you know, really awesome because that's gonna give a, uh, um, a really powerful sound experience in those bigger spaces. Uh, and we all know that, you know, the, the, some of these bigger homes that you guys probably install into, um, that's really important. And it also makes your design more efficient. So, you know, where perhaps with Connect Amp or another amplifier, you know, you could uh, you know, slice that up and do it with two amps, that also increases your cost um, or the customer's cost. And, um, you know, just, it becomes a little bit more uh, complex in terms of the installation. Um, so with one amp, we can deliver, um, you know, six speakers. Uh, we can also uh, tune the sound with TruePlay. So uh, for years now, we've had the TruePlay technology baked into our all-in-one products, such as PlayBar or Sonos One or Beam. Uh, but now we can, uh, we've never had that capability in the Connect amp, you know, with uh, traditional uh, architectural speakers. But now with the Sonos Plus Sonance, we can actually deliver uh, TruePlay calibration um, in that space. And this is really important, particularly for an in ceiling or in wall speaker, because those products more than any are very, you know, affected by the different construction materials or how the house was built or what kind of material is behind the wall or if there's a baffle or no baffle. So it's really important that we have this true play capability because that's really going to help offset some of those variables that uh, you don't often times get to control in a, um, installation of an architectural speaker. So design, uh, six and a half inch cone, uh, perfectly designed for 125 watts of power. Um, I've actually installed these in uh, some cabinets and um, done some A-B testing and uh, the sound experience is really awesome. And I can tell you that the, uh, the true plate does definitely have an impact uh, on where these are placed and, and what kind of materials are surrounded by. So uh, very good you know, sensitivity, low distortion, um, you know, really quality build and designed to, uh, you know, to handle the test of time. So quick peek at the, uh, the in-wall product. 
Uh, again, similar price point to the uh, the in ceiling at five ninety nine a pair. Again, these are also available now and shipping. Uh, again, paintable white grill uh, that is magnetic, so it just simply pops on uh, after the installation is done and uh, and ready to go. Also capable of doing uh, three pairs of the in walls uh, to really deliver you know an awesome experience. So you know, imagine this uh, being used with a frame TV um, where you have a nice plush installation. Uh, it's going to look seamless. It's going to be um, really, really well received by uh, you know, by those who are uh, sensitive to the aesthetics of the installation, uh, because you're just not going to see the technology, and that's really important. Uh, again, totally optimized for Sonosamp and fully true, true play uh, capable. And lastly, is the outdoor product. Um, again, I can't say enough about the build quality of this product. It's just Fantastic. Uh, it is going to ship a little bit later. Um, we're a little bit ways down the road, probably um, uh, springtime, uh, that this is going to be available, which is perfect because that's when you know, things thaw out. We can finally go out outdoors again. So uh, it will arrive just in time for those outdoor installs to occur. Uh, priced at $7.99 a pair, uh, fully rated for outdoor use. Uh, simple installation. I don't know if you've ever used any of the Sonyans products, but they make it super easy because they actually route the uh, uh, the speaker wires through the front of the speaker, uh, which allows you to install it when you're standing on a ladder perilously um, uh, without, you know, uh, having too much difficulty. You can actually mount that bracket and then route the uh, the speaker wires up, you know, without having to uh, delicately balance on top of a ladder while trying to, uh, uh, you know, tie in the, uh, the speaker wires to the connection. So it makes it super simple and, um, you know, really, really good build quality. So a couple of tech specs on this. Um, same one inch tweeter, six and a half inch water, uh, fully IP66 waterproof rating. So it's designed to be used outdoors, get wet, you know, uh, have that heat variation uh, in the summer or the, uh, you know, the cold temps in the winter. Uh, so again, really, really awesome build quality and um, fantastic um, acoustics as well. Uh, this is also optimized for Sonus Amp. You know, you can use three pairs if you wish um, to deliver that six speaker experience. Uh, it does not have uh, true play capability simply because there is so many variables in an outdoor environment um, that we simply can't, you know, guarantee what that true play um, your recommendation would come up with because you've got so many uh, acoustical variables. It's just not really possible to do that. Uh, however, it is matched and will use a custom DSP uh, when it is connected uh, to the amp. So it does, um, you know, definitely have a better acoustic uh, you know, experience than a traditional speaker simply because it is matched perfectly to the amp. And again, that same Sonos white grill uh, is available. So uh, again, you know, kind of stated this a couple of times, but it, you know, it's really about uh, making a seamless uh, installation that's, you know, not going to, um, you know, stand out and the technology is going to be hidden, but we're still going to have that, you know, really impactful, immersive uh, audio quality that Sonos is known for. Uh, wanted to kind of show you a couple of things here, and, and I'm sure there'll be questions on this, but um, when you actually set these up, uh, when you go into the, uh, the configuration of the amp, it actually will trigger uh, a screen that looks like this over here on the right. And it basically says detect Sonos architectural. So that little menu there would not show up with any uh, stock in ceiling or in wall speaker. And the way that actually detects that is because the impedance value is custom matched to the amp. So the amp sees that, hey, when I have, um, you know, this value of impedance load uh, connected to me, then it will actually show you this um, particular little menu. And when you actually um, touch on that and activate the detect Sonos architectural, it will actually play a very high frequency, uh, high frequency uh, pitch uh, from the speaker itself. And then the app actually will recognize the signature of that frequency, and it will be able to identify specifically what model of speaker that is. So it'll know if it's an in-wall, an in-ceiling, or an outdoor. And each one has its own unique frequency, so it will be able to accurately identify that, um, hey, I've got a pair of in-ceilings here. I'm going to adjust my DSP settings to perfectly match that speaker. So that's how that, um, that whole process works is because of the custom impedance value. Um, the amp is able to detect uh, this over a traditional in-stock, you know, stock in-ceiling or in-wall speaker. 
And once that's done uh, and it's detected which model it is, then the true play function will be enabled and it will actually uh, walk you right through that process. And um, if you've ever done true play on a play bar, it's the same exact process using the, uh, the Sonus by Sonus architectural speakers. Uh, you simply take your iOS device and you walk around and wave it up and down for about a minute as it takes measurements and actually creates a response filter that then runs in the speaker real time. Uh, so it really gives you a, uh, a dialed in experience and uh, for very little time investment, uh, it's gonna give your customers a, a much better sound experience. Cool. Um, so just to kind of you know, review True Play, um, if you've never done it before, uh, very simple process. It's, it's not a new concept. I mean, obviously, you know, home theater receivers and so forth have had this technology for years. What we do is we make it really simple. Uh, so instead of having, you know, a big long microphone cable that you put in the middle of the room, uh, and then you go through a very complex set of menus in the home theater receiver to, uh, you know, to run the, uh, the test tones to actually have it can calibrate. Uh, and sometimes it's a very lengthy and perhaps not very user-friendly process. We're using the microphone that's built into every iOS device as that mic. Um, and we allow you to just simply walk around the room, take about 100 different measurements, uh, you know, over that one minute. And then we actually create a, uh, you know, a very complex algorithm in the iPad itself. And then it sends a response filter back into the speaker or the, um, the all-in-one, like a play bar or a beam or something like that. And essentially runs that response filter in real time uh, to match the acoustics of the room. So things like uh, furniture and carpet and so forth can be very deadening materials, and they can make it sound kind of dull or uh, without a lot of high end. Uh, this will basically take you know those variables into consideration, and it will change the uh, the output of the speaker accordingly. So simple to do, uh, very easy to uh, to set up and configure, and uh, you can actually even do an A/B comparison. So if you've ever done True Play. Uh, you know, and configure it, you're like, like, wow, what's the difference? Well, you can go into the app, go into the room settings and actually see the true play toggle button. And as you're playing music or, or a movie, you can actually toggle that bu button on and off in real time. And it will basically disable that filter and turn it back on so you can hear the difference. Uh, and that's really powerful because, uh, you know, you can, you can show your customer or you can just verify that, um, hey, this, this definitely had an impact, or in some cases, it may not have an impact just simply because the room is neutral. Um, one thing of note with TruePlay is that you have the ability to add your own EQ. So if you've ever done TruePlay, you will notice that the EQ actually gets set to flat. Uh, if you wish to add more bass or treble uh, or adjust anything after the fact, you can simply add uh, more bass or treble or decrease, uh, and it will just basically add that on top of what the TruePlay has already configured. So uh, just bear in mind that that is uh, fully possible to do. Uh, and then one last thing, because I always get this question, I'm gonna head it off at the pass. Uh, why is TruePlay not available on Android? Well, the reality is we actually did develop it for Android in parallel with iOS. However, what we found is that the variability in Android you know, hand, handsets were all over the map. You might have you know, a really premium style phone, like a, uh, like a Galaxy S10 or something of that nature, and then you might have a very cheap phone that's literally 50 bucks, uh, and the microphone quality was nowhere near the level of the, uh, uh, you know, the Galaxy phone. So um, the reality is, is that it was just almost inaccurate because those cheaper microphones were delivering, you know, inaccurate results to TruePlay. And so that's why we did not release it on Android. It's not to say that we may at some point, uh, but we may restrict it to certain higher level phones. So chances are, you know somebody with an iOS device, um, an iPad, an iPhone, you know, the microphone quality across all of those devices is uh, very consistent. And that's why we uh, chose to release it specifically on iOS. Uh, lastly, um, you know, configurations for using the Sonos by Sonos. So again, using the TruePlay, you could do a 2.0, uh, 2.1 stereo. Uh, you can do all the way up to 4.1 stereo or home theater uh, if you're using that HDMI ARC interface. Uh, or you could do three pairs and actually do 6.0 or 6.1 stereo. So if you really want to rock it out, uh, do a 6.1, and uh, you're going to have plenty of audio to fill that space uh, with 125 watts of power built into the app. Cool. Um, I wanted to show you guys uh, a couple of things because uh, Rick had mentioned that there were going to be some questions around uh, what level of control uh, is available in the 
AMP. And you'll actually see here, and if you haven't uh, done an AMP yet, um, this will look a little bit different from what we used to have in Connect AMP. Um, so for example, if you're configuring a sub with the AMP, uh, you do now have the ability to actually configure the crossover frequency. That also applies to a third party sub, so it's not just a Sonos sub, so you can actually adjust that crossover frequency of where the AMP will trigger that sub uh, low frequency effects. Uh, you also have the ability to change the phase control, so this helps you, um, you know, deliver that optimal uh, sub experience that um, you know, is gonna really dial it in and uh, yet not be too overpowering for, uh, you know, for the space that it, that it's in because you don't want to overdrive a sub and you know if it's particularly like a condo or something like that you don't want to really tick off the neighbors there so um you do have a lot, a lot of these granular controls in the um uh in the advanced audio section uh of the particular room that you're using amp in uh, so those three things are different and uh and new uh that we have not had before cool uh another thing that i uh, wanted to mention and this also applies to the amp it actually did uh, come as a new setting when the AMP was launched. And this was really in response to, uh, you know, the dealer feedback that said, hey, we need uh, the ability to actually configure a dual mono um, on an AMP because sometimes you're doing outdoor. And, you know, it's rare that you have a nice square shape to work with when you're outdoor. Um, you know, you may be putting speakers uh, that are, you know, arrayed around like a pool area and you know one's way in a corner and another one's you know way in the other corner and you know sometimes a stereo image just sounds horrible because you know the speakers are not um you know really aligned symmetrically to the listening area so with the dual mono we can now give a uniform experience across those types of applications and it's as simple as literally checking a box in the app so this is available on the app uh, you can change it from stereo to dual mono, and it's going to give you a, you know, again that consistent audio, um, you know, from the speakers, no matter how or what position they're placed in. So it's available under room settings and advanced audio. And then lastly, uh, this is actually something that um, uh, has been asked for for a long time, uh, and it's kind of close to my heart because I'm a big network guy. Uh, but for, you know, Connect Amp being deployed in racks all those years, um, we get this question all the time. Uh, what is the best practice? Do I hardwire one and then uh, let the rest of them be wireless? Do I, you know, daisy chain them all together? How do I do this when I'm doing multiple amps in a rack? And one thing that's um, now available is the ability to actually disable the Wi-Fi radio. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you do hardwire a bunch of amps in a rack. Um, you probably, some of you may have experienced this in the past where a network loop forms and the whole network comes crashing down and everything is just going haywire. So the reason that happens is, is because every Sonos player has effectively two paths to the network. It has both a Wi-Fi radio, and, you know, Wi-Fi radio connection to the network as well as an ethernet. Uh, and if you hook up, you know, any player hardwired, then what can happen is, is that you know, because there's two paths to the network, one via the ethernet, one via the Wi-Fi radio, uh, a loop forms and basically broadcast traffic gets recycled into the network over and over and over again until basically the whole thing lights up like a Christmas tree and it stops. So uh, how can we prevent that? Well, if you are, one way is to just simply hardwire one player and that effectively creates only one single path to the all of Sonos Net. Uh, as well as all of the uh, Ethernet side of the network. So that's one way. However, um, hardwiring you know, players is always in our best interest because it provides for a very reliable installation. We aren't subject to interference or wireless range issues or anything of that nature. So if we have the ability to hardwire and we have Ethernet available where our players are, the best practice is always to hardwire the player. Now, how can I prevent um, you know, loops when I have a density of say 12 amps in a rack and I hardwire each one into a dedicated switch port. Well, if you're using a managed switch, what you would wanna do is enable STP, spanning tree protocol, okay? What that will do is effectively allow the players to detect when there's two paths to the network and they will automatically disable, um, you know, one of those interfaces when they transmit. So uh, you don't get that loop uh, scenario to occur. Uh, another way to do this is that we now have the ability to actually disable the Wi-Fi radio. If you had that scenario where you have 12 amps in a rack and they're all hardwired into a switch, I don't really need the Wi-Fi. 
right? So I can just turn it off. I can go to the room settings of each individual player, disable the Wi-Fi radio, and now you've eliminated the possibility of a network loop occurring because, again, there's only one path to the network. Each player has that Ethernet connection, the Wi-Fi radio is turned off, and basically you can, um, you know, there, there's not going to be any loop issues because there's there's never a scenario in which it could occur via the two paths to the network. Now, what if I have those 12 amps in a rack and the customer decides, hey, I want to have one of those new Sonos Ones because I want to have it to sit on my back patio. Um, obviously, that unit is likely not going to be hardwired because it may move around. So what can we do there? We can actually take a Sonos Boost and we could hardwire that. Ideally, we would hardwire it somewhere central to the home, not necessarily in the rack. And then that way we've actually created a Sonos Net Cloud, okay, similar to a Wi-Fi access point, that basically that roaming player or that wireless player uh, can connect to. So again, that's effectively created a um, you know, cloud of Sonos Net that um, you know, other devices connect, connect to reliably. And we're still preventing the loops because all the amps are um, have their Wi-Fi disabled and connecting over only over the Ethernet. Uh, and last kind of rule of thumb here, and want to make sure that we don't do this, is do not daisy chain players. I'm not saying it won't work; it will. Um, however, it's just not good practice because effectively you are just adding more load to each individual player because the you know traffic just gets retransmitted twice. So it's kind of an unnecessary and inefficient design to daisy chain. Um, but you know, it, it, switch hardware is now cheap, uh, so it's best to just hardwire them directly uh, into individual switch ports. That's going to give your most efficient, most reliable, and most uh, responsive um, design and installation. Uh, one last thing is the um, I mentioned about configuring a managed switch for STP. Uh, if you're using an unmanaged switch, then you don't have to worry about anything because an unmanaged switch is just going to pass all network traffic. Um, you know, without filtering it um, because it's just basically a dumb switch. So, um, you know, it's, again, still best practices to hardwire each one independently into a switch port, but um, you you, uh, you don't have to do any configuration, obviously, with an unmanaged switch. Cool. All right. Um, this I will actually make, uh, this is all the tech specs on the, uh, the different models of the Sonos speakers. Uh, the Sonos by Sonos speakers, so the in-ceiling, in-wall, and outdoor. Um, I will make these available to all net, so uh, they can perhaps um, you know, provide that as a PDF to you guys. Uh, but basically, this gives you all the, uh, you know, the, the nitty-gritty. Um, as to what comes with the product when you buy it, there's actually the speaker itself, uh, and then there are two grills. Um, we are actually making available some um, accessories, so things like roughing kits and so forth, those will be available separately. But what comes in the box is basically the speaker and the grills. Cool. All right, I will open it up to questions. All right, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. All right. uh, if only you couldn't. <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions. We got a bunch. All right. So the first question that comes through, and I love this one. So if you're using a, if you're using two Sonos amps in a 4.1 configuration, you said that you can either connect the, you can either use a Sonos sub connected wirelessly or hardwired, or you can use the output of the front Sonos amp to drive a third-party sub, like say you know, uh, an amplifier for an in-wall sub to do a more of a custom install. So the question that comes up, so th you said that definitely works, correct? Yes. Okay, the question that comes up is if you use a 5.1 system with a play bar or beam for the front three, and then the new Sonos amp for the rears, can you use the sub output of the Sonos amp on the rear channels to drive an amplifier, an amplified sub, like again, the uh, uh, like an amplifier that's driving a, a, an in-wall sub kit, or a standalone sub that's not a Sonos product. That's a great question, and my first response, and I'm I will get clarification on this, is that no, that sub output is disabled when it's being configured for rares. 
Um, but I will get okay. clarification and a, a full detailed explanation as to why. Um, but um, my first um, inclination is to say no, that sub output, it's only available when it's configured as a front, um, a front speaker. Okay, Brandon, I'm writing your name down here on my notepad. So I will follow up with you once we get that clarification. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, Edgar wants to know if you use the dual mono mode, can you still use TruePlay? Uh, yes, uh, TruePlay is still enabled regardless whether it's um, stereo or dual mono. Okay. With the, I will make one caveat there is that uh, I did sure. mention that the uh, the outdoor um, scenario is um, true play is not enabled on the outdoor Sonance products, uh, so that would only apply in a in an indoor scenario, um, or I mean an in ceiling or in wall scenario. So the uh, okay. outdoor do not do not allow for true play. Okay, um, I've got some questions about the streaming services. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that comes up is uh, YouTube going to be um, available on the Sonos app? It's the number one app request, uh, Jack says, for his his clients. Uh, YouTube Music is actually available now on the Sonos app. Uh, oh, nice. It is a pay service. I'm actually verifying it. So you should see it when you go to add music services. It is called... I think it's just YouTube music. Yep. Scroll all the way to the bottom. It's there. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, all right. So I got another question from Brandon here about um, the streaming services and the, the DACs that are built into these units. Um, are there any plans with these new items like the Sonos Amp? to support higher sample rates or DSD streams versus PCM? Yes, we uh, we do not support anything beyond the standard CD quality of 1644 today um, in any of our products. Uh, it is a conversation that we are constantly evaluating the landscape, you know, the competitive landscape, the industry trends, where the streaming services are, what they are shifting to, uh, and we certainly you know, are always keeping a keen eye on that in terms of how we engineer products. Um, certainly we, you know, build the platform for, you know, maximum quality possible. Um, but today our highest um, rates are the uh, 1644. Uh, the only, the streaming services that currently support that, and there may be additional ones, uh, but as of, I would say about a year ago, where uh, Tidal and Deezer uh, were really the, uh, the two streaming services that supported um, full CD quality uncompressed audio uh, over Sonos. There may be other ones now, but uh, uh, those were the two primary music services in the U.S. that were able to deliver, you know, those uh, those higher quality audio streams. Okay, and then obviously we've got the ability to uh, stream from a local source like a NAS or something like that, where we might yes. have uh, uh, 24. 96 or 24 or 92 content. Um, but yeah, the, um, I use, I mean, I use uh, Tidal or no, mm -hmm. I use, I used to use Tidal. I, I, I've switched over. I started using Deezer and I use the CD quality, which is, you know, obviously 1644 mm -hmm. and it sounds pretty good. I mean, I've had, you know, high res players at home. I've got a, a Sony portable player that Adam was nice enough to gift to me and it sounds fantastic, but you know, realistically the, the ease of use of Sonance means that that thing sits in a drawer all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. one, of the, one of the things that comes up, you know, when you when you look at the, the higher bit rates is, you know, reliability and the scalability of trying to do that wirelessly um, and meeting customer expectations because, you know, the bandwidth requirements to go from a 1644 to a 24192 are considerable. <laughs> um, I mean, when you're trying to pump that much audio around six, seven, eight zones that are, you know, potentially not wired together, um, you get into, uh, you know, the, the physics become a little bit of a obstacle there. So uh, that's, you know, we have to always blend, you know, that experience and scalability with the, uh, you know, with the audio quality. Sure. And sidebar note from like from, from my perspective. So mm -hmm. 
when we when we share that, the the rebuttal that always comes back is, well, what about my Roku stick? What about my Apple TV? But those aren't synchronized. So the <laughs> issue isn't necessarily because right. yeah, you might have a 1080p stream in one room and a 4K stream in another room, but they you know they each have individual buffers, whereas yeah. our system has to be absolutely synchronized. Exactly. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, so Jim is asking, this is a great question because I've actually experienced this myself. Um, when using TruePlay, uh, the speed and movement of the phone uh, is constantly reporting that it's not working and they it asks to try again. And he wants to know if there's any, like a YouTube video or any sort of tutorial or tips you might have on how they want you to move this phone so that it doesn't keep saying try again. <laughs> That's funny um, because it, ha it happened to us here at the office. Yeah, it, it's um, that's a great question. I I have not experienced that, although I have heard it, you know, from others. And one thing I would say is is, is definitely try and, and kind of create the optimal environment, you know, as you as you do that true play. And by optimal environment, I mean you know it doesn't always require you to remove like a, a phone case or something like that. But you know if we can make it as neutral as possible, that certainly takes some variables out out of the picture. Um, so if you have a case on there, remove that. Um, if you, uh, uh, one thing I've found that, you know, definitely will trigger the, uh, you know, the sequence to stop is, is for example, like a, uh, you know, an air conditioning unit where you may have, you know, air blowing through a register uh, that might be at, you know, a high velocity or something like that. It may not sound like it's a ton of background noise, but I found that that more than anything uh, can really stop the, uh, the sequence. Uh, even though it sounds very subtle and, and very low frequency, it, it definitely you know impacts the uh, the background noise signature. So if you can turn off any ventilation that might be occurring uh, while you're doing the true play, that can definitely help. Um, also, uh, potentially, you know, do this in your in your uh, uh, without any shoes on, maybe just wearing socks, uh, simply because depending on what the sole of the shoe is, it may. Uh, affect the accelerometer in the phone to detect, you know, more uh, aggressive, you know, uh, movement. Uh, so that might help, you know, make that experience uh, continue unimpeded. So uh, just some suggestions there. Um, and lastly, I mean, if it's just not working on that particular phone, I, I would benchmark it and try it on a different iOS device just to see if, um, you know, perhaps the accelerometer on that particular iPhone model is just a little bit more sensitive than others. Okay, and uh, forgive me if you reviewed this in the body of the presentation, but this is available for use on generations of iPhones going back quite a ways, correct? Is it based on the iOS uh, uh, firmware revision, or is it based on the hardware? I believe it's a combination of both. So it's uh, you definitely have to have a minimum level of iOS, um, and there's definitely uh, you know phones that you know three, four generations ago that simply will not be supported on. So we usually have a, uh, a chart somewhere on our support site that basically shows the uh, the versions of software uh, required for TruePlay on iOS. And then also the, you know, basically a matrix of the uh, the hardware software, software accommodations. So what models of iPhones and so forth. But we do, um, we have started to, uh, uh, you know, kind of create a retirement around certain really, really old iOS devices that uh, they're just not going to support that feature because the microphone quality or, or you know, is, is not, not up to speed. Okay. I can find, I can find that and uh, I'll give it to you, Rick, and then you can share it out. Perfect. Yeah. I'm happy to, to distribute it. Like I know in, in my, in my uh, desk full of useless products, I've, I still have a 5S because that's the smallest form factor one that has the good mm -hmm. camera in it. And I use it as a, right. an iPod. And then I have a 6S Plus because it's the last one that has a three and a half millimeter jack output. So <laughs> I'm holding on to the old technology. Tim keeps <laughs> Kim keeps daring me to step up to a modern phone, but you know, I, I stick to the old ones because they have the things that I need. Alrighty. Um, let me see. Uh, Don is asking about the webinar. Uh, yeah, so Don, we are recording this. We record all of our webinars and we're going to go ahead and archive this on our YouTube channel. I'm going to write your name down on my notepad as well and I will follow up with the link. So if you started later, if there are other 
uh, members of your staff you would you'd like to uh, share this information with, I'll make sure that you have it. Uh, I'll look for your email in the registration log and I'll make sure and share it with you. Uh, probably won't be, give us like five to seven days. We have to uh, compress all these and upload them. And it's a person who's in our company who's very busy. So sometimes it takes them a few extra days to get to it. All right. Um, so Jack and Jim are both asking questions about uh, network storms and network loop on the older product when you could not disable Wi-Fi. Is that something that can be done with a firmware update or do we have to resort to kind of our old best practices whenever we're using the legacy products like the old play product or the um, uh, the previous generation connect amp or the connects yeah so that the cool thing is is that um, this is platform wide right it's not specific to you know a particular SKU or a particular generation uh, you could take a connect amp from you know 2011 and essentially do the same thing. So that feature is in the app. Um, and as long as you have the latest, you know, software loaded onto that connect amp. So firmware updates and all that are up to, up to par, you will have that option. Um, this is, we did not discriminate on this one. It's, it's completely platform wide. So you can do that same disable Wi-Fi on any of the older generation products. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh. All right. So we've had a couple questions about, and uh, since this is going to be recorded, I want to ask this toward the end because we're going to go ahead and edit this off. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, feel free to ask them now because I've got some questions uh, pertaining to the business model, and I want to ask them at the very end so we can edit them because we don't want that information on YouTube for the general population to to hear. Um, let me see. I'll go ahead and review. Oh, Brandon has a question that's fair game for the for the YouTube. He wants to know if you still have to wear a suit every day when you, like when you work for a lighting control company. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, I uh, no. I am um, <laughs> my my uh, my Sonos attire is generally a Sonos polo and uh, you know um, comfortable shoes. I'm on the road a lot. We can vouch Brandon because when he's when he's or Brandon when he's in here he's definitely not wearing a uh, suit coat. All right, let's see. Um, it's funny. I don't know of anyone. It's I don't think I've ever seen anyone at Sonos actually wear a tie in my entire five and a half years. <laughs> I don't even know if they own a tie. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm trying to think back. I don't think I recall. Is Sonos is pretty laid back. Laid back company. All right. Uh, the next question that came up, and this is this is kind of unusual. Um, so Sonos obviously has their own um, digital compression and their own algorithm for synchronizing. Um, Dante is, has kind of taken over on the commercial world. Is is there any? Is Sonos considering making a product that's compatible with Dante, either a separate SKU or, or like a different mode, so that you can go out into uh, across a network and uh, feed a Sonos stream into Dante-enabled devices? I apologize, I am not able to comment on anything roadmap-wise or sure. technology-wise that um, you know that is in development. I I can tell you that we um, keep a very very keen eye on um, you know, again, the whole technology landscape, you know, from a, audio wise, you know, video wise, and really always look at, um, you know, where the trends are, but that doesn't always you know, mean that we adopt, uh, I think sometimes we, uh, you know, we choose, uh, technologies and implementations based on, you know, what our experience standards are. So, um, but we okay. do, we do, uh, we do keep a very keen eye on the industry. Absolutely. Fair enough. All right. Um, and we can definitely confirm this is not uh, currently a Dante product. It's a, it's a proprietary Sonos uh, digital communication between all these devices, correct? Yeah, Sonos Net is, uh, is a, um, a Sonos branded technology that the platform is built on. And certainly, I mean, Brandon, I think you're 
I don't know that your question was necessarily if you could use this with Dante, but I, I can share that AllNet distributes. We have products that are uh, Dante line level inputs. So you could take the output of, like, say, a Connect and go into the systems. You just have to purchase a Connect to uh, take the, an analog feed into the Dante encoder and then off you go. But that's another conversation for another webinar. All righty. Um, Jim has a couple follow-up comments about uh, his experience with True Play. He said he definitely one of them was on carpet. And um, iPhone 6, latest update. Uh, the homeowner wasn't home at the time. So he wound up not using True Play because he couldn't get it to work. And he said it wasn't practical to uh, to go back. So okay. hopefully, hope, Jim, hopefully it sounds good out of the box. And hopefully you were able to go in there with the tone control. You're, I know, I know you, Jim. So I know you're an old school audio guy. Hopefully you're able to go in there with the tone controls and tune it up by ear a little bit, and at least give your customer the best experience you could. Um, if you're able to go back, let us know and let us know what the experience is.